Okay, hello everyone. Uh, today we have a special presentation for the MedTech Talent Accelerator Program, uh, which will be given by Chief Scientific Officer and co-founder of SACAD Analytics and Professor Emerita in Biomedical Engineering, uh, Dr. Mimi Galliana. Mimi is replacing her daughter, Dr. Isabel Galliana, CEO of SACAD Analytics, who cannot make it today. Uh, the MedTech Talent Accelerator is a new collaborative program between McGill and Ryerson University in Toronto, Ontario, offering graduate students uh, supplemental training and experience for careers in the medical technology industry. The training component of the program features flexible online courses, uh, a hackathon, a job shadow, training in equity, diversity, and inclusion, and industry seminars like today. The experience component is a four to eight month internship in the medical technology industry. I encourage everyone to learn more about the program and apply at ryerson.ca slash talent accelerator. Today's presentation will be live streamed to Ryerson and to all those who are RSVP'd and a recording will be made available on the Ryerson website. This is our first year offering the MedTech Talent Accelerator program and this happens to be our very first Explore MedTech Innovation Seminar at McGill. And we couldn't be happier to have Dr. Galliana as our leading presenter. Uh, SACAD Analytics owes its existence to lab work done by Mimi Galliana over more than 30 years, beginning when Mimi was a McGill PhD student studying the eye movements of astronauts who had returned from zero gravity missions. SACAD took the top spot in the health sciences track at the Dobson Cup Challenge in 2017 and in May 2018, SACAD took the first place Hakeem Family Prize for clinical innovation as part of the inaugural McGill Clinical Innovation Competition at the McGill Faculty of Medicine. The startup is a family affair with Mimi as Chief Scientific Officer, daughter Isabel as a former doctoral student at McGill as CEO, and husband Francisco, a retired McGill Professor of Electrical Engineering as Research, research and Development Lead. We'll have a Q&A following the presentation so please submit your questions through the link on the screen, which I will post right now. Where are we here? All right, so please submit your questions through this uh, link on the screen. Please note the last few uh, digits are case sensitive. All right, and without further ado, Mimi, please take it away. Thank you, thank you all for coming, and also welcome to the Ryerson Group. So I hope uh, this, will, this presentation will give you some ambition to try something different. Even if it doesn't work, you'll get excited and learn something. Um, the focus is going to be on uh, a, a translation exercise of uh, monitoring and examining eye movements as uh, cues to any d diseases that involve the brainstem and the brain itself. So there are lots of uh, types of eye movements and the issue was to try and simplify this evaluation and make it portable uh, down to the hockey rink or out to the school or whatever. So I'll get started first with a short video, if you want, you're not, okay. A short video that at least will give you a chance. My daughter couldn't make it. She's in a business meeting, naturally, as CEO. Um, but this video will show you a summary of what the company does. And then in the talk, I'll give you some snippets of issues that came up, why we did it, how we did it, what worked, what didn't work, um, the, the tribulations you go through when you start something different. So if you can start that. When you go in for your annual checkup, they, they check your blood pressure, they check your body weight, they check your heart rate, but they never check the most sophisticated organ in your body, your brain. So that's what Insight does. It evaluates brain function. So CAD Analytics emerged from McGill University's Biomedical Engineering Department from 30 years of research of my co-founder, Mimi Galliana, who also happens to be my mom. Over the years, I collaborated 
a lot with clinicians in uh, dizziness clinics, vision clinics, and it, I discovered that we really haven't changed much of anything over 50, 100 years. Until Insight came up with this device, it's complicated because you need to move the patient into a room that would have all the equipment necessary to assess different spheres of, of vision. Right now they go into hospitals, into clinics where you have very expensive equipment and you have wait lists of about 26 weeks to get into those tests. The tests themselves take about an hour and a half and are very unpleasant for the patient. It seemed to me in today's world with mobile phones and laptops, etc., there had to be a better solution that would bring the equipment to the patient and produce the answers quickly, not days later. So the idea was mobility and accuracy in a small package. We used to do VOMs, so we were looking at people like just with the eyes, so inside is giving me numbers, actual raw data, like objective data on what's going on. It's compact and it allows us to, to say quite a bit about the the ocular motor function of an individual. Inside, I have a laptop with the VR goggles. It takes me a few minutes to set up. Test takes about 10 minutes, and it's very portable, so I actually take it from one place to the other. Our value added is really in the longer term over tracking and recovery and rehab. On voit beaucoup le défi c'est des lignes, mais il faut suivre les lignes. Et avec ça, on peut voir les professionnels, ils peuvent voir nos yeux, savoir s'il y a des problèmes avec ça. C'est assez facile. With Insight, you can have it in schools, in senior homes, at the side of the field for sports teams, in arenas, really anywhere. It's a, it's a laptop and a pair of VR goggles. It's a mechanism to evaluate general brain health, not just the sensory inputs that have been done for years. It's a support for diagnosis, just as you would give the temperature from a thermometer to a doctor to decide if he had, the person has a fever. The testing of eye movements at the push of a button. Okay, so that gave you a snippet of uh, what the problem is in very vague terms and what we wanted to end up with, which we have. We have a device at the, at the touch of a button that produces diagnostic information for the doctors. So I'll go through the steps that we went through that are basically what's needed whenever you get organized to do this kind of work. That this is a summary of the challenges at the, at the top that um, were in existence at the time we started. We, incorporated in 2016 and started working in 2017. So we're, we're uh, not newborns, but it hasn't been a long time. Um, the obstacles we wanted to get rid of are long delays because there are too many people who need the tests and the equipment is located only in a few sites for each of the kinds of eye movements. And uh, the lab equipment costs a fortune. A rotating chair, for example, is $200,000 to test dizziness. And the um, um, tests are all done uh, anywhere else that I know of. No, no one else allows uh, natural freedom. They're all done with the body fixed in some apparatus or against some apparatus. You're leaning against uh, some kind of scanner or you're strapped in a rotating chair and your head is tied to it. So you can't move anything except your eyes. So the only thing that they can work with is an extrasensory uh, stimulus, like a sound or a visual target in the front, to cause eye movements and eye reflexes. But the point that we uh, made throughout the years when we were looking at data is if you let a person do this in their natural body movement, they perform much better. Obviously, they have more parts to move, but the reflexes change. So when you test someone in a very artificial condition, you can't say, oh, they're normal in that moment. But they may not be normal when they're walking around their house. You have to test in a mixed sensory environment in order to do it 
in conditions that are relevant to daily life. That was the idea. So uh, that was the way you, date, you collect data. So the other uh, challenge is that um, the metrics that are used traditionally, what, what's measured from eye recordings, whether or not it's done ideally, uh, are very noisy because the data is variable if you're in an unnatural situation. So if you have variable data, it becomes difficult to distinguish patients from normals when they're on the fringes of a statistical pool. You, you can't t t tell them apart. To, you're not sure. You have to do more tests. <clears throat> so the other thing is that most of the equipment in large hospitals has its own software attached to it. You need a tec technician to run this large software. I mean, the extreme is the fMRI. But then someone has to analyze the data that comes from the device. And that takes time. The technician can take up to a week because of the workload, the patient, the number of patients that come, to pr provide the results back to the doctor who asked for the test to be made. And so there, that causes delays. And whoa, to you, if your problem is not the test that was done, for example, dizziness on a chair, and it comes out clean, then you must go to another clinic and go through that routine again. Long delays, wait for the results, because every test is focused in specialty clinics. There is no place that combines them all. Um, so I've gone through the analysis challenges. That's the, how you decide to collect data and, and analyze it. The other issue um, we had to go through as a company who's going to start and invest time and money, is it worth it? And uh, so we went through all the business of finding out where would be the potential customers. It turns out that dizziness and uh, concussions, anything that affects your, how your stability, your postural, and your visual clarity, uh, is the biggest market on the planet. That's the only way to say it. If you just take sports, you have lots of customers because they all get injured playing rugby, hockey, soccer. You just pick any sport. And it's all the age ranges, from kids all the way to people like me. So it, it, there's no problem with the market. You just have to prepare it in a way that it can be used in each market. And so you want a flexible design. That, that's part of the uh, right, what's necessary. The other thing we have to go through is start digging in the regulatory rules in the Canadian health system and in the FDA. And then if you leave the North America, there is Europe and Australia. They all have their own rules. That is a nightmare. So you start in one place. We started here in Canada. So, OK. Um, and next slide, please. So this is to give you an idea, just from the point of view of uh, vestibular ocular reflex, as it's called, the eye movements in response to dizziness or moving your head around. So you see that chair wobbling around. You see how that person is wrapped up and can't see anything. It, this is one test where they flip you around, but the other ones are they spin you like on you're going to take off. Um, but you, you, you can't do anything. She's strapped in. Yet, she can only move her eyes. I think it's a she. <laughs> anyway, the other kind of test, because even among the dizziness tests, there are many different ways of doing it. This is physical rotation of the body. This is injecting hot water in your ear. And believe me, it's not pleasant. You feel like you're spinning off in space. And that's to test which ear is sick. So they do this twice. They do it on that side, and they do it on the other side. And from that, they will take measurements. They're, they're recording the eye movements. And then they'll use the classical metrics that they normally compute. How fast is the eye going for one case compared to the other eye? Or if you change the speed, what's the difference? Is, is, is the sensor, the vestibular sensor, limited? So this is a status we started with. Here they had numbers from recordings. But there, that's the status on the field for sports. An, an athletic attendant or a rehab person has the 
sports person, the, the, the athletes stand in front of them. If they suspect a concussion, they just bashed against something, and they ask them to track their finger. That's it. They look at their eyes. If there's a tremor or something, that's pretty obvious, but sometimes eye movements are very small, and they, they see if the eyes move back and forth, but they can't tell, are they on target? They just know, does it respond to going right or left? Very, very subjective. That was the status when we started. So next slide, please. OK, so we decided there were two aspects we wanted to make sure that we would provide in whatever we developed. One was that it had to be able to run around anywhere. You had to be able to carry it in your bag like a briefcase. That had to be um, something you could even toss into your trunk. It would be very stable. The other thing was that we wanted the, the uh, gathering of data and the return of the results to be almost immediate. And it turns out that we can do it in less than five minutes. Plus, given the, these are just, you know, awards we got and so on. You've already been told about it, so don't, <laughs> you don't have to bother reading. Uh, we were obviously on the right track. But um, the other thing was that I didn't list was that each sensor that needs to be tested today has to go to a specialty lab with an, uh, an expensive piece of equipment for that sensor. Then you travel to a different clinic, at whatever date later. They don't usually schedule these all on the same day. They don't, they don't have the time. So you have multiple trips to multiple clinics that can be in different parts of the city. And then later, all that data that gets accommodated together. We now do five or six tests in five minutes in the device, one button for each test, like 30 seconds between them, automated. So it's a portable hospital from the point of view of testing, of measuring eye movements. You don't have to travel anywhere. Uh, you could even buy one of these things. It's no more expensive than a VR game package. They, for those who, who are well, well endowed with money, they could have one at home. It doesn't matter. There is no skill needed. So, the next, next, please. OK. So this is how we do it, as I said at the beginning. We use VR goggles as the get data gatherer, which are controlled by a laptop to present whatever test we want. It's either, um, you be, and you're allowed to move your head. You notice that there's no clamp around the neck. So they can do this, and they can do this. They, they can do, move everything except their lower body. <clears throat> and in the goggles, we can, depending on what you present as a stimulus, whether it's a dot that you have to track for pursuit, which was <laughs> like that thing you saw earlier, or it's a moving background. Um, you know, when you're in a car and the, the, the scenery is going by you, that causes a reflex too. Uh, all these reflexes are, are tested by choosing the stimulus you're going to put up in the goggles. So you provide the correct scene, and we measure the eye movements during that time. And the specs, can we go to the next, please? No, OK, back, can you back up? OK, the, there are specs. If they come up again, you don't have to read them. Because you have to record. So you have to pick your goggles that they sample fast enough to catch the uh, bandwidth, the uh, frequency content of the data you're going to measure. So eye movements are very high bandwidth. You have to, they're at least 30 to 60 hertz. So you need at least 100 hertz image sampling, data sampling, sampling for every channel in order to, for it to be uh, reliable, otherwise you're going to, you're going to run into uh, overlap, you know, violating the spectrum laws in signal processing. So that's one thing. Second is you have to measure everything in the dimensions that is going to move. You have two eyes, not one. A lot of the experiments in hospitals measure one, and that's it. So you have to measure both eyes. And they have to be measured in both horizontal directions and, horizon and vertical directions, so horizontal, vertical. So that's a 2D response from each eyeball, plus um, the pupil size, which has to do with virgins. And there are other things we can talk about later if you have questions. So you have to have the channels for two dimensions for the right eye, two dimensions for the left eye. 
three dimensions for the head, because I mean it does much more complicated things, including this roll, which we can't measure on the eyes <coughs> at the moment. So three dimensions for the head, angular, but there's three dimensions for the head, translation, because we bend our necks, so that means the, the sensors are moving their center of rotation. So there's six dimensions for the head, and a total of four for the eyes. So that's 10 channels of data that you have to collect at 100 hertz in parallel, not sequentially, all at the same time. <clears throat> and then that data is, is, is packed into a standard matrix. Doesn't matter what your test is, we've made everything standardized so that if we add a test or we modify a test, it doesn't affect the pipeline for signal processing. So um, it gets sent up wireless internet to the cloud. So the test takes about four or five minutes, the tests, plural. The cloud analysis takes less than a minute for all the data. So the doctor turns around and comes back, the test is there on his computer in a PDF format or in a, um, an active uh, document, uh, like a dashboard. And the, that document has all the information that we've calculated for each test. So it comes in tables and graphs. So you get to see the time plots if you like. Next, please. So the result of this approach, and this, there you see is a pursuit test in 2D, in red. That's why <coughs> I said it looked a bit like the, something that came up by accident earlier. Um, it, the metrics, when your data is measured correctly at the right sampling rates, there's a lot of data out there that is very noisy. So the first way to have an, a metric that's repeatable is to have a sampling rate that's high enough and have decent denoising and other steps to clean it up. So what we've got, so, you must believe so far, is that it's accurate because we've taken care of the signal considerations. Portable, I mean, you know, I, mine is here. <laughs> I can carry it like this instead of the hospital. The diagnosis is within minutes, non-invasive, so it doesn't have to go all the way to FDA medical device clearance, you know, that sort of thing. Scalable, because if you want to do a new test for a new disease, you just change a display in the screen. So you just have a library of, today I'm doing that test. Scalable also to the, for the, be, from the point of view of marketing, because since we use a server for all the number crunching, and they, the servers automatically, if they have a big job, they just split it among multiple servers. So if suddenly, and it would be lovely, our customers were multiplied by 10, they wouldn't have 10 times the delay before results, because it's not done sequentially. They would all get the results in the same five, six minutes. So it's easy to scale up in the market and in the um, test content because you have only changed one box if you change the disease you're targeting, the first one, what you put in the screen, that's it. So because it's more accurate also, it, with this approach is very good for um, baselining and checking people regularly because they probably, we, it would detect a problem that's starting much earlier than waiting till you have uh, serious symptoms. And the cost, that's the joy. <laughs> a rotating chair, one test, right? $250,000, $200,000, not counting the equipment that goes with it, and a technician's salary. Our stuff that does five tests, not just the VOR, it's within $10,000 for everything, for the software, for the, the goggles, for the laptop that goes with it. So the cost benefits to hospitals, for example, are incredible. And if they, I don't know what they'll do with the old equipment, but anyway. Um, but it makes it accessible to smaller groups like schools and gyms and sport fields and, and, and things like the hockey players next to the hockey rink when the guy gets bashed with a stick, you know. And it's a horrible sport the way it's ruled. They need to change the rules. <laughs> so, next one, please. Okay, 
So now that we have, I've mentioned already the top part with the, the requirements of what, how much data you have to record. So now the process of how we do the analysis is again to make it easy if you want to make changes or adjustments because we're always evolving. You find out, oh, this is a spot that's not ideal for speed or accuracy and you can change it without changing anything else in your program. So the first one, when you run this, this uh, portable system, is you pick a protocol in a list. It's all in the, on the screen to select. So that brings down a matrix of data for that test. And they're all encoded, HIPAA, HIPAA cleared, so that privacy is protected. So you select the protocol, it means give me a data matrix. All of the data is denoised in a statistical way, it's a new filter that preserves the look of the nystagmus. I'll be showing you nystagmus afterwards, but the issue is, think of a triangular wave. Dum, 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 okay? You put that through a classical filter, it becomes a sine wave. All the corners get rounded off. That's awful when you're trying to put metrics on an eye movement. So we want to preserve that shape, but we want to get rid of the jiggles, the noise. So the denoise is a very important step because that facilitates classifying the segments. Like all nystagmus, there are two types of movements that are taking turns. Slow ones, because they're slower than the fast ones. It's the nomenclature for 100 years. You go quickly one way and slowly the other way. When it's slower, it's because that's the reflex. Following a target, jump, I made an error, following a target. So you want to preserve the edges in order to be able to classify properly. Once you have that, the rest is just algebra. That's why it's going so fast because all of this has been optimized individually and they just feed into each other. The next. Okay, so what are we doing with it? And in the next, in the, well, until this spring, the two years will have been dedicated. Once we had the uh, format of the device set, the software a uh, fully running pipeline, that's when you start doing testing. Can I detect anything? Even I do perfect analysis, but is this doing anything that makes a difference between a patient and a normal person? So we've done tests to, uh, or repeated tests on populations where the uh, data is first been um, um, denoted by a doctor as it being a, t a patient or not from that doctor's perspective. So it's like a clinical study. They, we get the data, the, the, uh, the clinician uh, looks at the data his way or her way and decides, oh, this is normal, no, that's not. So that becomes a uh, classifier index that sorts the data. And then we run our studies, we run our own code and we, we look at the numbers we compute from it. Do they see a difference too? That's the way we certify that the, the uh, the implementation is doing the right thing, that it has similarities to the current, but it's more precise. So when we find a problem, maybe something was missed, one, at, at one characteristic or one metric, that's, that's when we do the, we go around the loop and we verify the code to make sure that issue is addressed and tune the code and update everything. So another advantage of uh, having it done this way is, is the, the test library, that means the protocols you can do. It's becoming longer and longer because changing a test is a few lines of code. It's not writing a program for each test. So we can always try um, to modify what's going on in the test and use it for rehabilitation <coughs> instead of to test whether a person's normal or not normal. Let's say you know they're not normal, you know what metric was faulty, so design something now that will push that metric in the right direction. So we can start using it to support and um, uh, train people on what they need to do in order to restore their function. So it's, it's self self-driven 
rehabilitation, and it does work. So that's a whole set of tests that are quite different. They're used to dry. If you were sitting in a room that was spinning all the time, after a while, you would sort of ignore it. It's like we're going on a boat and people get seasick. After a while, they figure out how to ignore that frequency of motion. So you don't want to do rehab on something weird because that's what the body will get used to. You want to do it on what isn't correct and force it to change. So that's the first thing that I forgot to mention. You do not want this test to be predictable. You do not want, if they do on day one, do it on day two, do it on day three. Current tests in concussion, for example, is a questionnaire on paper. Always the same one. Hockey players know them by heart now. If they have the first test and they're really dizzy, they can't remember anymore. But after two or three tests, they remember that test, and they just answer the questions like a parrot. And they may not be better. They just can now remember. <laughs> so what we do in all our tests is randomize. Each time you sit there on that test, it'll start somewhere else. It'll look a little bit different. That, that loop you saw there might start here. The other one might start there. So you can't memorize a response. So that's absolutely necessary. That's daily life. We don't know when the bird's going to hit your head. Yeah, you just don't. You would duck. But you know, <laughs> you don't know ahead of time it's going to be at second 221 or something. So that's what we do technically. And on the business side, we made sure that everything was HIPAA certified, which we are with the servers are the ones that get certified for that. That's for privacy. Um, we're looking, one of the uh, risks we have for our business is that we're only using one kind of goggle. It's not a complicated one, it, it runs at 100 hertz, but there are newer ones coming out, and prices, uh, you know, 250, 500 hertz if we want it. That probably will double the processing time, but it might be worth it for some tests. But we don't, they don't sell them in large enough quantities right now to feed clients like for our company, because each lab wants, has to have the whole, all the equipment. So we're, we're, we have to keep our eyes always on whatever new goggles, equipment that we're using are coming out, including the gaming computers, laptops that go with it. We have to keep track of that, and usually prices can go down, surprisingly. Um, we have, and from the point of view of progress, because this is 2018, 2020, uh, we have contracts with the pan-Canadian uh, clinics, rehab clinics that deal with court cases also to certify whether a patient has recovered or not with insurance companies and the hassle. Sometimes people don't want to go to work. Sometimes they do for the wrong reasons on both sides. So we have a joint venture with Australia, which is why the SHEO's business is interesting because Australia is in that group. And she got, uh, Isa got to travel to Australia and meet the Aussies, their rugby teams and everything. They want to do this to baseline and keep their athletes in good shape. And um, though our first FDA application was rejected, we just chose the wrong device code for what we're doing. They were treating us as if we were an x-ray machine or something. So we now learned our lesson. Check all the codes before you submit. We're resubmitting now. We'll see what happens as a basic measuring instrument in a medical instrument, but me it's just measurement. It's not doing anything to the patient. So, so for the next. OK. So an example for those who, who are thinking about starting new companies or something, there's always um, a step where you want to quantitatively verify that your claims are true. And so, for example, the VOR test, the vestibular ocular test, produces nystagmus, but it's very different depending on how you move the head. It doesn't have the same profile, and so when you produce a metric and you compare a, a subject who has done passive VOR, that's on a chair, he's not doing anything, sitting in the dark and it's being spun, and you compare that patient to another patient that's allowed to do this and has targets while he's moving around, they're both VOR tests. 
but the context is different. And even if it's the same person, the number here is not going to be the same as the number there. So what we wanted to do here, we just took 50, 25 healthy uh, young adults, 28, 25 years old, and we made them do all these tests four times, and two on one day, morning, afternoon, and two a week later, morning, afternoon. And we wanted to see if the tests come out the same. The numbers you get out of them come out the same. Same person, same test. Of course, they start in a different place. It's randomized. But still, it's the same conditions. And that was used for us to verify that this test, which has multiple sensory inputs, was more consistent and more reliable than these others that are only doing VOR and no neck is a, and there's no neck movement. Here, you have vision, you have targets jumping, you're allowed to use your head, you have, uh, when you use your head, you're creating the, the rotation of the head, not a machine. And all of that together gives a response that's better and repeatable, no matter how big the profile is. You can do the comparisons at different levels. So this is how we verify what's the best metric, what's the best protocol. Nobody does this except us right now. A few people do this. The, it's the classical chair. And this is where you're allowed to move your head, but you're in the dark. So you're shaking. Eyes closed. No vision, no nothing. So what's the goal? The, the reason these things here are not so reliable to think about when you're designing a tool for, a, for signal acquisition is if you don't give a goal, a task, something they have to execute, then they'll randomly, they'll do something different each time. So you can't trust the numbers. This forces them to behave properly <laughs> as best they can. Next. So this was just a table that showed from all the, the repeatability and the error in velocity. Remember the, well, I didn't mention, the goggles we have have a precision of one degree. When you take a derivative, you at least double the range of the precision. And this one, 1.7 degrees per second error between the four tests, you know, the repeatable tests. So it, it's better in almost all of them. And notice the worst ones are here, no target. No target means no goal. If you put in a sound, that might be a goal. But nothing except your neck moving around? No. You can do it. It doesn't give you anything reliable. OK. So we have a piece of hardware now and software that is satisfying our initial criteria. So now we have to start thinking about where are we going to apply it. So this last slide is basically to uh, show the general directions that we're going. So the first one is machine learning and AI clustering. That refers to if you have lots of metrics, so lots of measurements, but you know you can put a, a ticket on each one to tell you this belongs in bin A and that belongs in bin B, sick, not sick, you can start looking at your array of metrics and decide which ones are best associated with a normal response and an abnormal response and which ones um, are most sensitive to the difference between those two pools. So that means we could help in the diagnostic approach. That may be a little more trouble for regular you know, FDA and so on. You start having diagnosis, you have to prove it. But that's an area we think is very important because even if we don't use it for diagnosis, it will tell us which is the best metric to compute in the first place. Don't bother computing the other ones. And which test unmasks it the best so that you reduce even the data co co collection stage. So the next thing is we have lots of um, analysis of nystagmus right now. Oh, I didn't show you. I will show you a curve in a few minutes. The analysis of nystagmus right now is not suitable for patients' data. The nystagmus is abnormal. So the assumptions made in the current analysis works great on a normal subject, but does not on a patient 
and uh, anyone that has an abnormality in the pathways that drive the eye. In addition, we have um, uh, pilot studies with clinics, like uh, the Children's Clinic at the Montreal General. Um, and uh, geez, I'm forgetting now. I think I have them on a the slide. Uh, but we have uh, Dr. Petito at the, in, at the MNI with concussed uh, subjects. All of, all of these pilot studies are to compare the, di the distinction they have. In Dr. P Petito's case, he classifies with uh, fMRI in certain parts of the brain. We would classify with this. So if we agree, if we, we both say, oh, this is a, a patient in the, uh, the discussion, you don't need the fMRI unless something is really strange. You can skip the fMRI if they agree for mild concussions or bad concussions. If it's really bad, then you do go to the, to the brain scanning because you need details about exactly what place. But if everything's OK and they both agree, fMRI and that, in this pilot study, we'll say, OK, in that case, Always use the goggles, the portable stuff first. Is there a yes, no, maybe? And then go to the fancy, expensive clinic with the $800 a scan because you've justified it. You don't take aspirin unless you have a fever, right? Well, that's a simple case. Um, OK, so I'll just skip the other. But it, it, here, we, these are the next things we have to worry about if we want to move into the States and move into Australia and so on and Europe. There are new regulations in Europe. We have to spend the next six months at least going through those doggone catalogs and books. And, uh, it's no fun. Um, but you have to know, because uh, if, if you don't submit the right thing to the particular country, they just shut the door, I mean, not because you're doing something bad. The other thing sometimes people forget is the rules on finances can be different in different countries. When you, how you submit your taxes, what, when are you treated as small business if you are, when are you, what's the tax level with the different, what's, um, um, what do you call, reimbursable in the different tax systems. So it's another nightmare. I'm, I'm visualizing when we're richer, a body for each of these things, you know, <laughs> doing the, dedicated to that job. Next one. OK, this is just to give you a simple example of what I mean about a metric being bad. So um, this is a patient. It's actually a simulated patient, but it looks exactly like a patient that has a time constant. This is a time constant related to how well you can hold your eyes in space. If you look somewhere and the, and the lights go out, you can still hold it. This person can't. His time constant only one second. So he did that in the dark, he would drift. Okay? You can see that here, that the eye movements, this is the red, the real eye movements, slow phases, are drifting away between saccades. Okay. But the standard metric in all the clinics is to fit a sine wave through it. It's obviously not on a sine wave. So you get the wrong numbers. This person gets classified as being normal because the peak is in the right place. But it, you know, it has to be where the maximum velocity is. So it's only there in the right place because the eye switched, because of this. You see the, the saccade here pushed that up. So slow phases in the vestibular ocular system and any nystagmus system for eye movements, each piece of slow phase gets a kick in the butt by the fast phase before it. So actually, the response is a function of two modes, the saccade and the response to the sensor. It just changes during the saccade. Here it's pure saccade, and here it's been kicked. So that green curve there at the bottom is an approximate envelope of the response. But it has nothing to do with the dynamics you're trying to me measure, the metrics you need. So that's an example. Well, we have to re-examine all that. Next. OK, real data. You see? This looks like a sine wave, right? The pieces line up nicely. 
Eh? So in that case, the assumption that's being used classically is usable. But it's still not uh, correct, but it's usable. The next, next, OK. Um, this is a patient with one side that's weak. This does not look like a sine wave. You see how this thing is bobbing up and down? Here it's creeping up, and here it's creeping down. It's totally irregular, because every time it's kicked, depending on where it's kicked, the response is better or worse. So the main effect is that there are many more fast phases in one direction than the other, because that's where you need the most kicking. That's the, that's the interval where the sensor is weak. The, another metric will work. The one we use, we use is in red. It's still high percent. That one is falling down, the envelope, the green. So it gets worse as a patient is worse. So the point is, we've illustrated that there has to be new analysis methods, and that's one of our next steps, and validation and everything about them. Next one. OK. Just to give you an idea about the kinds of activities we do to validate new ideas with a lot of data, um, the Canadian study on, uh, on concussions is led by um, Yates in Calgary. He's applied for one of these network grants, which is it looks like it's going to come in, but they want us to do the quantitative measurement while they do their normal measurements. So this is for, for children over six months. And children are not the same as adults for, for the eye movement issue. So you really have to have reference databases that are different. Um, at the MNI with Dr. Petito, we have a MITAX with the concussed adults, young adults only, from the hockey and football, from McGill University teams, et cetera. And um, the Children's Hospital, we already have an ongoing um, concussion study there. They have a concussion clinic at the Glen, and they have our device there, and they've been collecting data for a little over a year now. So the databases are growing. We have lots to play with and from the t point of view of what treasure is hiding in that data, depending on, on the uh, source of the damage. Hmm? OK. So th this is just, since it's, we're talking about startups, I had these things come up. You may be three, four people when you start. Um, the, you may be in a situation where uh, some of the people on the team or one person on the team thinks he's the king and, or she and, and mistreats the others. You, you, you have situations that you have to recognize as you start that when you start, it, everybody's doing something for everything. Everybody has a piece of the pie, the, the problem that's being addressed. It's real teamwork. It becomes separate, assigned work when you have more people and they can dedicate all their time to one big problem and maybe have helpers. So you cannot have anyone in the group say, I'm better than you, basically is what I'm saying. And that's the CEO's job, is to keep the atmosphere friendly and co collaborative. And anyone who misbehaves in terms of just manner be, be, with colleagues should be put in his, his or her place as early as possible. And if you can tell from my tone that we've had instances and some people had to go. It, and it's, it's a waste of energy not to, it's better to stop it early and have lunch together once in a while. I'm, I'm sort of insinuating that when you're starting, you're just a little extended family. You're not anything else. Nobody's the boss. Somebody is an, the lead advisor and keeps the threads together, but that leader also has to listen to what they say and change their mind sometimes. So it's true collaboration. If you can't do it, don't start a company, because it'll only get worse. So that's where I'll stop. And thank you for your time.
Okay, just a reminder that uh, there's a link to please submit your questions remotely. We'll ask, uh, we'll have one more question here. <laughs> so yeah, thanks. I, mean, I, I have a more serious question. Mm -hmm. So I actually it's on the same topic than, than uh, Christine just asked. So you mentioned that you could apply this kind of to other diseases, and so yeah, maybe all you... those that affect eye movements. Right. Okay. Because we're measuring eye movements. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, maybe two questions within that context. So well, what kind of diseases, and, and could you have a universal test for those diseases, or like a test that oh. covers many diseases? And, and you uh, also mentioned okay. I mean, that's maybe the second question, like longitudinal testing. Yes. So can you see? I mean, well, I guess so would it help have a baseline for the person and then see changes? Yeah, we we've already see? set that up. Okay. That we do a baseline, like like the teams that we work with, and then whenever they get tested again, it, they're compared to their baseline. So um, sometimes nothing is different. So the, the kid, it's usually in kids' teams right now, the, the kid is OK. And you can tell when he's walking around. But we just want to confirm that the goggles work properly. And sometimes it's obvious. And, and when they go to their family doctor, they seem normal. And the family doctor says, you can go and play. You can go back to, to play. And some coaches push like that, too. But when we test them, uh-uh, they're not ready. They don't react in those reflexes uh, fast enough or precisely enough. So they would be in, in danger of getting hurt again. And so how can you monitor general health or other diseases with this eye? Or, or oh. how general is that? I mean, well, will, will my I, eye movement degrade as I age? Or uh, No, it's not just, I don't think, I think it's probably the last thing to degrade if you're otherwise healthy. <laughs> it's, it's the lightest part of the body, you know, you have to lift your heavy legs. So. Um, no, um, what's known is that concussions and Alzheimer's, Lou Gehrig's, all of those early in the disease affect the nature of eye movements, like saccades. Saccades are more delayed, they're slower than the norm. I, I think Louis would be the person who could answer that. But there's a pool of, of uh, diseases that affect the brain in general. It's, it's a degradation in general. And the earliest thing affected is eye movements. I've read a couple references on that. And so I figure um, diseases like that could be pooled with one test because they have a similar foundation, a similar cause. What it is exactly is the, is the, uh, the job of the doctor to do, I don't know, uh, scans of the brain, chemical tests, uh, to find out what, what is the deficit at the molecular or cellular level. Um, in terms of completely new tests, it's just a new box in the analysis pop line and a new box in the data, data requisition, you know, the, the, the test, the protocol you create for them to respond. And that is a study in itself. What is the best protocol to test to, to unmask it? That, that's why we visualize it like a Lego game. You have boxes here, and when you press a button, you're picking one of them. And you put boxes here, and they flow to each other. OK, we do have a couple questions submitted remotely now. We'll start with the first one. Uh, could you please talk a bit more about the financial part? How did you get funding, or how did you get into the accelerator? Ah, OK. Um, well, at McGill, you go to the Dobson Cup first. We knew nothing about business management, OK? The only person who knew anything that has to do with balancing a budget was my daughter, Isabel, in economics. So she could look at things from above, and she knew all the links on the internet for budgeting, for funding sources, and so on. But most of us didn't. So Dobson was our first exposure. And we won the Dobson Cup, and there was money attached to that. We've still got that checked on the wall, first check. <laughs> Um, and other competitions like uh, the Hakim Prize and uh, Clink, Click Award, at, um, for that, that's the Hakim Prize. Um, OCFA, OCTAS, the Quebec Prize for MedTech, we, we managed to get the first prize there. And that was also uh, with uh, bursary that went, uh, you know, an amount of money that went with it. So these came in to allow us to buy or a stage person or um, uh, uh, an extra piece of device that we needed to 
make the work easier. We needed to buy computers for the staff <laughs> to do their work. Um, but otherwise, uh, we use the provincial and federal grant agencies that support startups. If you submit a, a project that is a trainee will take, they give you, they pay the salary. If you are successful, you can do quite well without going anywhere else. We did have in the X1 competition where they sent, they sent uh, us around the US and Canada for um, demo days, you know, posters and speeches to people. Um, that brought in, especially at the Dragons Den in Toronto, a couple investors with more bigger sums of money. But aside from that, we try to use the system as much as possible until you're big, because what we've learned by experience of others is that if you, people have approached us, they want to give us a big sum of money. But then the sum of money is compared to what is the current value of the company to figure out the percentage they own of the company. So you can guess that if you get that money too early, they own the whole thing. <laughs> and, and that doesn't help you. So you want to wait till your value has gone up enough that um, they get a smaller piece. Okay, so that basically, that's the way we do it safely. Okay. Thank you, Mimi. Uh, we'll take another question here at McGill first. It was actually made more of a comment um, regarding the applications and the diseases. Um, I think the neurodegenerative disorder is obviously a very interesting area of application, but I was wondering whether you were, your team was considering also neurodevelopmental disorders where you know, it's not necessarily that there's degeneration, but things like autism where people mm -hmm. scan you know, their environment differently with their eyes. We and, are. You know, we for are. children, it'd be fantastic yeah. to have something where I'm guessing yes, you'd have to Something to retrain, for... to help them mm -hmm. uh, pay attention and, and not, not be undistractable. Mm -hmm. but, um, yes, uh, we are. We've, we've made a list of diseases. But at, at this moment, the best way to do it is, um, uh, from our point of view, is, is uh, the minimal investment first of using the current code and designing some of the re, you know some of the rehab protocols we have, for example, could be a big help. But we won't know what works until we collaborate with someone like you, <laughs> who would want to work um, for in the rehabilitation hospitals or in the autism school. The, there's a special school here. They might want to try that. Yeah. Okay, we have another question here uh, submitted remotely. Uh, why did you decide to sell the device with goggles and a laptop and not just as software? So including Be okay. hardware, yeah. Uh, because you have to collect data. Gotcha. Right? Your software is only there when it, it's fed food data. So um, because we wanted the data to have the right quality. A lot of the data is, is sampled these days at video rates, which is horrible when you're measuring eye movements. Um, and so that, that distorts any analysis. You can have the best code on the planet, but your answers will be not very useful. Uh, and at the same time, we could do multiple tests in just a few minutes, not just the one test that the person wants. So. Perfect, thank you. We have another question here at McGill. <laughs> uh, thank you. I have a question that's more on the, uh, the business side. So you mentioned the three different jurisdictions, the Canadian, US, and European regulatory yeah. systems. Uh, did you try to get approval in all three at the same time or at different times? What was the no, I don't decision? think so. I think you have to go to each one. That's the problem. So we went to Canada first because they were the most reasonable, as usual, compared to the Americans. Um, and, and they recognized a device that is basically to measure and detect, not to interfere with the subject. It's, not, it's totally non-invasive. So that, that's the lowest class in Canada. <laughs> and it's enough for us to do anything we want here, unless they change the rules. Uh, but in the U.S., it's very different. Um, the FDA is, is uh, I don't know, there's so many classes of devices there, and they decide, oh, this doesn't fit in this one, you, you are violating the, the rules here for that. They don't, their clinicians 
checking that you reproduce the clinical tests they already have in the country. That, that's basically how they work. You have to produce this test, and it has to give the same answer as the other guy does. Well, the other guy's using the wrong analysis. <laughs> Why should I want to do like that? It's impossible. There has to be a change in their system. But they have a new category now that we'll try for that's a little more reasonable. Yeah. So. Do we have any more questions here? I think uh, the remote questions have stopped coming in. OK. Oh, yeah, sure. Go. Thank you for coming here and speaking with us today. Um, I have a question about your business model. So how exactly does it work? Do you sell the hardware uh, and that's a one-time cost? Or do you also sell a subscription to the okay. hospital? We do both. <laughs> both. Okay. So what, what happens is the, they have to have the hardware on site. So uh, <clears throat> we uh, acquire the uh, instrumentation that's necessary and load the laptop with the necessary recording software. <clears throat> and that they take home. And they pay up front once for that. And then we have a service contract for each time they go to the web to have something analyzed, there's a fee. And that's it. Okay. Simple. <laughs> okay, and just a follow up question on that. Um, are you aware of any companies that are your competitors right now that are trying to do the same thing as you are? Not using the web and um, goggles in the same way. There's some, they're similar in that they make a claim we can detect concussions. And the test is, a person sitting with his head fixed <laughs> and looking into a, a screen that is uh, producing a square. And they're just tracking this square. And they claim that they know that person has a concussion from whatever they measure from that one thing. I don't believe it. I haven't sent, seen any test retests. But a lot of, of clinics have bought it because it looks so simple. You know, you sit there and then, then they get an answer. Um, but three months later, they call us. We want your goggles. This is not consistent with what we see in our patients, the little square. So there, you have to be very careful when people claim that they are um, better or uh, conflicting with us or imitating us. You have to go into the details on the websites. Most of them have some details of what they're using. And <clears throat> say, well, I'm not worried about that. Let them buy it, they'll throw it away, and then they'll come back, <laughs> which is what happens. Let's please give her a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Please accept this uh -huh. honorarium on behalf of the MedTech Talent Accelerator Program. I oh, see. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. I'll peek later. <laughs> Thank you all.